We have been making huge progress on the build, and I haven't been able to keep up at the same pace with my update videos. So I'm going to quickly go through some bullet points and summarize what we have done this far. And if you're the kind of person who wants more off-grid inspiration in your life, then consider subscribing to the Off-Grid Guru on YouTube. In last week's update, we took a look at Ron's first tiny house to give everyone an idea of what the finished product will look like. And it's awesome, so if you miss the tour and want to check it out, I'll put a link in the video description. Last week was roofing week, and in last week's update, we had just started the roof by putting up the rafters and the insulation. Then we began installing the plywood. Unlike the roof on the first tiny house that Ron built, this house has only two penetrations in the roof where the hot air will escape from the greenhouse through the vent box openings. So we cut a hole in the plywood where the vent boxes will be installed. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. For those of you who've been watching, you might have remembered that we left an EPDM skirt vapor barrier draped outside the house perimeter. Because the north roof is hanging over the exposed ground, we need to create a barrier between the ground and the wood of the roof so that we don't get rot in the future. And all of that is capped with a metal drip edge as we transition now into waterproofing the plywood and putting the metal roof on. With the drip edge installed, we began rolling out the bitchethane waterproofing membrane. Right, boys. With the waterproofing membrane installed and the vent box openings framed and cut, it was time to install the classic Earthship Green water harvesting safe metal roof. Working in the windy mesa, never leaves a dull moment on the job site. We worked until the sun went down and the moon came out. In regards to the roof, what you just saw, that was the easy part. A quality roof is in the small details, and I think I'm going to save those for another video. And for those of you who noticed that I skipped explaining how we installed the windows, well, do I have a treat for you. Ron is an ex-professional glazer, so when it comes to glass, he knows what he's talking about. And I have an uncut interview of him explaining the installation of the thermal pane glass on an airship. Check it out. Hello again. Today's a big day. T today, today we're going to do some glazing. Okay, so for all of you that don't know what passive solar uh, is for heating and cooling for off-grid housing, today's an important day. Uh, what we have here is a 46 inch wide by 76 inch tall, they call it a PDR, it's a patio door replacement. It's technically a standard dimension that comes off the machines. One inch higher or wider would double the cost. So just to give you an idea what these windows cost, right now they're all the way up to $325 as of today. Uh, they've gone up twice already this year, once on January 1st and again in the middle of the year. So in a few more months, who knows where it's going to go. They're averaging about 15% increase each time. So the glass, when it comes, you've got a couple of options. You could do certain thicknesses, certain thicknesses of each piece of glass on both sides, the, the width of the spacer. The spacer is very important. This is um, 
actually got a cavity inside of it and it's got corner keys. And the idea is before this, these two pieces of glass are glued, glued together, this spacer allows for a desiccant to be filled inside of it. So inside here are these little balls, these little silica balls. It's nothing more than just like a little, like those little sandbags you find in your leather cap or leather boot box. What it is, is it's a condensation absorbing agent. And it's important that you get high quality windows because over time, condensation will eventually wear out the desiccant inside of these spacers. If that happens, say in about 10 years, this is gonna fog. If it's not, it doesn't hurt passive solar, but it will hurt your view. And a lot of people care more about the view than they really do about the way the glass is performing. So what they can do is they can take them apart, replace the spacers, put them all back together and recycle it. But a lot of people in the past found it to be too laborious and too expensive. Well, now that glass is going to these new prices, it might become a consideration more and more. Simply put, you just take an oscillating knife, cut the glass apart, clean all the glue, toss out the aluminum spacer, get a new one, new corner keys, and a box of desiccate. But you need a, a pretty high-end glue machine. It's about 1,500 degrees of this tar material that seals this glass back together, but you will get 10 more years. Since I'm talking about 10 more years, it just happens to be the same number as the warranty that you get with a PDR. A warranty for glass like this has to be installed either by a certified glazer or it has to be vertical. And in this case, because I'm an ex-professional glazer and I've worked with the guy that I buy the glass from, I get the warranty. It's 10 years on this warranty as long as it goes in vertical. If it goes in on a slope, the perpendicular angle of the winter solstice, which is what we've always done for decades. This is the way we would do this glass, installed on a slope. Now it goes vertical. On a slope, you get what they call a 30-30 warranty. That's 30 feet or 30 seconds after the glazing truck drives off your property. So that's your decision to make. If you want to get into rebuilding these after about five or six years, that's basically what you're looking at or having to spend a bunch of money to replace it. So what you have with this piece of glass is a breathing tube. You can kind of see them. Here's one sticking out of the back. Uh, the reason for this breathing tube is if this piece of glass comes from sea level, uh, without this breathing tube, you might find this piece of glass to be ballooned out like this. Because it's tempered, it won't technically break, but it can still balloon. It's a, it's a heck of a sight to see a piece of glass kind of expand. Now, you have to understand what glass is. Glass is silica. So it goes through, a, it's just basically sand. So over time, if I if say, I don't know, a million years, this might go back to its original material. So you want to make sure that when you get these pieces of glass at 7,000 feet above sea level, they've depressurized. And um, that usually is done before we even get it. Uh, if the glass is coming from Albuquerque, it's not a problem. If it's coming from Denver, same thing, not a problem. Those are already high elevations. So the glass is already sort of adjusted to the, to the pressure at this elevation. So, but before you install it, you need to snip it. So you'll just take uh, you know, a small tool, linesman's that cut wire or just a pair of little tin snips and just cut it off. What that does is it also pinches it, it closes it. So it also allows for the glass to be sealed up where this, this little breather tube is. The other thing you wanna make sure is you get your stickers off. If you leave the sticker on, it's gonna melt in the sun. The glass gets to about 140 degrees. And now you're out here with all kinds of chemicals trying to strip all the adhesives off. So get the stickers off right away. Uh, you also wanna take off these little, other little, these, these are also known as stickers. What these stickers do, these little blue ones, is it creates a little eighth inch gap between the glass. The reason for these is for spacing. If you put two pieces of glass against each other and you let the sun cook it, it'll blow out the one underneath, it'll break it. It's just too much heat and too much pressure. So the glazing company puts these on automatically when they come off the machine before they ship them. We're gonna take them off because again, in this intense sunlight, it's gonna glue these things on and it's gonna leave little squares on your glass. And if you're an OCD Virgo like I am, 
You're going to be going crazy trying to get that little smudge off. And there's like 50 of them on there. So, you know, there's only so much self-medicating you can do. So try to prevent yourself after they're already up and installed and in the glue and then getting closed up. We want to make sure this is kind of prepped. So when I have a couple helpers, they're typically prepping the glass. Now, here's the other preparation that happens. That's over here. So there's a couple things you have to do. All right. Um, one of which, uh, well, Matthew's going to probably use it again. We're going to repair the Tico. <coughs> there you go. Ooh, ooh shit. That could have been. That was a hammer. Oh, my God. All right. Well, I put my tools down. I can never see them anymore. Anyway. Uh, oh, here we go. All right. Are we still rolling? Yep. Okay. Okay. So before we even attempt to install a piece of glass, even with the best carpenters, we want to make sure that this window is square. So the first thing, and we want to make sure it's plumb. And so what I did is I take my level. I took my four foot level. I checked my framing. She's good. Checked my inside dimension. She's good. This is really important because these dead legs that were up here until today, they're holding this thing straight, but the plating on the top is preventing it from what they call a rack. Racking is where or the window box might shift left or right. If it's going north or south, then it's coming out of, out of plumb, okay? If it's doing this, it's coming out of plane. Basic terms when it comes to carpentry, but for a glazer, you wanna come in here and double check everything, because the last thing you wanna do is be holding you know, a 150 pound piece of glass over your head and it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't fit. All right, now, when I built this, I designed it to fit glass that's 46 in a, by 76. This is 46 and a half or a little less, 46 and 7 sixteenths by 76 and a half. The reason for that is glass has no flexibility. When this glass goes in, it's in for good. So we want to make sure that this frame has some expansion and contraction ability. So that's the reason for the extra space around it. The other reason for it is if you have any cupping or bowing or any twisting, which is kind of standard with a lot of this wood, you'll notice that it's all stained. It's only been up for about a week, week and a half. I'm not even sure. But even during that short period of time, it was important for us to go ahead and put a deep penetrator so it doesn't dry up in the sun. It wasn't affected by this latest storm. Actually, I think it's been hit with two storms uh, after getting it installed. So I came in with my speed square. I put my speed square right in here, make sure everything's lined up all the way around. It's important that these measurements from this corner to that corner are identical to this corner to that corner. That's any time you're speed, um, squaring up any kind of frame, whether it's a window box, a door bug, a cabinet, doesn't matter. Again, I'm not a carpenter, but I understand what they're doing and I understand the importance of making sure that they really pay attention to all of these things. So when it comes to today, we don't have a setback. Now, the other thing you have to pay attention to are these little guys right here. These little black things are called setting blocks. They're basically kind of like a rubbery uh, cushion, a bumper. And again, because this wood is taking on a lot of heat from the sun, and especially around the glass, which is accelerating that temperature rapidly every day when it comes in, this wood is gonna dry up fast. It's gonna heat up, it's gonna start expanding. Then at nighttime, when the sun goes down, it gets cold out here, real cold, like 20s already. So it's gonna start contracting and pulling back. So the idea of what this dimension is and what these do is it, it allows everything to kind of flex, allows things to move. And you need that to happen again, because if you make the glass the same dimension as the RO, the rough opening, you have no place for that wood to move and it will break this window. The only way to break a tempered piece of glass is the corner has to get nicked. You can beat the window pretty much with a hammer. I'm not gonna demonstrate that today. Just take my word for it, because I have done it. But you wanna make sure that these corners are really they have the space that they need when they go in. Now, the other thing you're looking at is this bead, this white bead. This is an acrylic latex. You can buy these tubes at Walmart for a couple bucks. 
The glazing company charges three times that. So just go to Walmart, buy yourself a bunch of white or clear, doesn't matter. In this case, because it's gonna be hidden behind the glass, I went with white. It's easier to get. All of us are trying to get all the clear tubes. They're always sold out. But in this case, because it's gonna be hidden, if it does spill out around later on in a couple of days, we'll just trim it off. No big deal. All right, so now, also the thing to mention about acrylic latex versus like um, silicone, silicone actually, did I say silicone? Yeah, I always get confused with Silicon Valley and silicone. And a lot of people do that to me as well. So silicone will actually dry hard. And you don't want that around your glass. Again, as I keep saying over and over again, we want the wood to be able to move and breathe and flex and expand and contract. All of that's extremely important around this rigid piece of glass. So this acrylic latex is actually an excellent product, even as affordable as it is. It's actually designed to flex. It's allowing the glass and the wood to kind of move. If you go with silicone, it will not do that. It will hold the glass against the wood. And then if you ever break the window or it fogs out after 10 years, hopefully not less than that, uh, and the other reason why your window might fog out is if you left it sitting out in the sun for like say a few weeks before you were ready to install. The glass was delivered less than an hour ago, which is the reason why I'm standing here right now in preparation to install this piece of glass. I don't want the glue around the outside of the window to dry up in the sun, not even for a day. So again, because I know I'm going to take advantage of that warranty in 10 years, but I don't want to have to uh, pull all this apart. Um, any sooner than necessary. All right, so as of right now, the one more thing that I have to have kind of ready are these little bad boys and my drill. Now, some guys will use um, a drill so they can control the, the speed. I've done a lot of these, so I will use an impact driver. Um, I've also countersunk for the screw. I also pre-drilled uh, to make sure I don't split this piece of wood. This is just a piece of wood that's been out here for 10 years, laying on my scrap pile. Today, we finally put it into action. What this does is we're gonna attach this block in multiple areas around the glass. And as I fasten it, what it does is it pushes the window against the glue and seats it into the frame, all right? So we wanna have these kind of ready. You, there's a couple of different things that can be considered when you're installing these uh, blocks is you really want to make sure you're stable underneath so the window doesn't kick out. You want to do the same thing so it doesn't kick out. And once we put the blocks on the side, it'll prevent it from kind of spinning. Now, for some reason, if you get into a situation like this where you're installing the window and it doesn't fit right, then what you want are these setting blocks of different sizes. This is an eighth inch, these are quarters, and they also have three sixteenths, so it's good have all three of them here ready to go. Now, because I just double checked everything, in theory, a quarter inch setting block should be all I need because as I mentioned, I left a half an inch. So that leaves me a quarter of an inch to kind of like wiggle the glass into the frame. If I have a problem, we can pull this out and replace it with an eighth inch. Uh, we're gonna leave these kind of close by, ready to go just in case we have to make an adjustment. Now we also have, um, somewhere around here is a suction cup. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna install the suction cup right when we pick it up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put it on the inside and that way somebody will stand, it's ideally three people on the 4676. If you get into the 4690s that we used to do, you're probably gonna need one more person. Uh, they get up over 200 pounds and they're unwielding, especially if it's a windy day. today. We've been blessed, we have a gorgeous day to do glazing. Uh, this is also what this is gonna do is provide warmth inside. So all of my equipment, my batteries and everything has been in my solar tool trailer, but actually it's gonna be better to bring in the batteries and the chemicals and leave them inside of the airship. It'll actually warm up everything even overnight, preventing it from you know having to thaw things out in the morning. Again, this time of the year in October, this is always a concern. Right now we've been taking everything home at the end of the day. So this is gonna start warming up the soil, the gray water that's down inside of the cells and the mass of the building, not just the tire walls, the adobe, but also the floor. We're getting ready to kind of start charging it back up. It's been charged 
when we pounded the tires from the sun, but then the cooler weather at night's been reverse charging it in the colder weather. So now we're gonna reverse that again to try to make it a livable situation for the winter. Okay, guys, you ready? All right, Matthew, let's go, Eric. Let's install. All right, unfortunately, this is shutting my entire job down, but we'll get back on pace here quick. We're only gonna install one window at the moment. All right, okay, so Matthew, so what you're gonna do, bud, we wanna get it kind of about here so we have the upper body strength. You're a lot taller than I am, so it's gonna be tricky. Eric, we're gonna pull it out, and as we walk, you're gonna get it behind us and get it about down here, because if you get up here with the cup, you're not gonna reach. Yeah, so Matthew, carefully pull it forward. Always paying attention to the corners. Give it just a slight little walk forward. Okay, so I'm left-handed, so I'm left side dominant. So let me switch places with you. I'll explain that to you in a second. And I also guide with that. Okay, all right, so the reason I'm spitting on my gloves, it makes it a little bit stickier. It doesn't slide quite as easily. Yeah, there's a good grip right there. Okay, so we gotta give Eric some time and space to get behind us. On three, one, two, three, up, walk, carefully. Okay, we're gonna have a little problem. Go ahead. Yep, right like that. I'm gonna put it down on my foot. Red gone. Okay, go ahead and go inside where Josh is standing. Okay, Matthew, one, two, three. Don't let it slide. Nice and slow. Okay, on my foot again. Now, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll have like a piece of foam if I need to rest or readjust. But in this case, I think we're ready. Okay, Eric, you're gonna grab and lift. Okay, Matt, go low. And then what you wanna do is we wanna set it on the blocks first, and then you wanna hold it out a little bit till we got it in. Okay, one, two, three, up, easy. Watch the plastic, watch your corner, set it on the block, more than halfway on. There it is, perfect. Okay, now we don't want the bottom to kick out, so we're gonna support it up the hair. Go up with it, Matthew, onto the block. Okay, now don't, don't go in yet. We got a problem. We have a situation. I'm gonna go a little left. Okay. Okay, so what's gonna happen, from what I can see, is I have a choice now to be to, can be made. So what I can do right now is I can see that the window's doing this. So I have an eighth inch setting block. I could ask Matthew to lift and slide it off. But I'm gonna go ahead and roll the dice. Okay guys, you hold it. Matthew, you need to, you need to kind of give me a tilt. You gotta bring it back out, bring it back out, and then lift just a little, a little more, a little more, okay. Then let it down. Okay, hold steady one second. Don't don't move. All right. Here's another another thing I don't recommend. It's called a cat's paw. You can actually use this to play with glass a little bit. But if you don't use, there you go. See how easy that was? I'm lifting it as a bumper. Okay. Now again, let me just look. Okay, Matthew, move your left hand. Be careful of the glue. Oh, is your fingers in the glue? You don't want to do that? No, it's not. All right, okay. Now here's what we're gonna do. On three, we're gonna pull it out and pop it. One, two, three, pop. Okay, yeah, we're hung up here too. Okay, hold it. Oh, I see it. Okay, let's bring it back out. Give me a push, Eric, just in the middle. Okay. Push it out, easy. Okay, let it come, Matthew, watch the glue. Okay, here we're gonna lift it again. Here's where you gotta be really careful. Any adjustments like this that happen, you gotta be careful you don't smear the glue all over everything. Okay, all right. Let's push it back in. Okay, Eric, take the suction cup, move it this way. Just a little. Okay, a little more. Okay, Matthew, you in? Okay, that looks good right there. I've offset the pilot hole and screw. And the reason for that is so I get more bite over the window. Let 
The other reason I like an impact driver is a situation just like this, where I find that the glass is kind of wanting to push back out on me. Uh, but it's really important, extremely important, that this glass gets sealed because if it's, if the glue isn't touching it, then you know that means that stuff can kind of like air can pass around. So it's becoming a gasket at the same time. And so the other issue is if it doesn't seat or sit flat, then when I go to put my mullion cap, which in this case, I added an extra strut for something more to attach to, then if I have just these two boards, which is what it called for in the plan, then when I put my mullion cap on, I end up putting my screw in the seam. So now I've got good meat. So, and I'm gonna do extras also, the way I've pushed the mullion cap back on to really uh, airtight and watertight uh, this seam. It's extremely important that these details are paid attention to. Now, here's another one that I like to do. Um, one thing, and I don't have to do it immediately, but this is something a lot of guys don't do. They won't get in here and fill this. That cavity right there, what happens is that if you don't put the mullions on and it's just sitting here in the sun, drying up, especially now that it's up and the glass is getting hit with a lot of sunlight, you can, uh, you can start drying them out right away. And this also gives it a little extra seal because right now, you know, all you have is that, that little bead that's on that piece of wood. So this is just extra reinforcement to make sure that the window doesn't slip. I have a lot of experience, not just as a glazer, in the industry, but I've lived in earthships for 16 years. And the earthship that I own, uh, all of these bottom plates are rotten. And my windows have actually slipped right out. So there's like two inch gaps uh, all the way across the top. So I had to plumb a whole bunch of acrylic just to put a Band-Aid on it uh, because a lot of moisture gets in between the glass and gets down onto the wood. And even pressure treated, uh, tracks, you know, or even sealed pine in this case, we have pressure treated, we have rough sawn that's sealed, we have pine that's sealed, we have an EPDM gasket, also so there's no capillary effect from the dirt inside of the tires. All of this is in, you know, preparing this from ever getting any moisture. Now on top of this, this vapor barrier is gonna come up, there's gonna be more insulation, this will get tacked in, then there's metal flashing that goes over this, and then there's a metal mullion cap. So if all these details are done correctly, there's never ever an issue with the plating or rotten wood or anything that could possibly happen to the glass. So, you know, there's, I mean, guys do different things, you know, different ways of doing things, but um, I do it the right way. So there you go, do it my way or redo it. <laughs> Cut. That's it, pal. All right, there we go. Thanks, buddy. Okay, oh, one more thing, Bruce. We still rolling? Okay, one more thing, I almost forgot to tell you. When it comes to brand new glass, we do have some smudges on it. We got a little bit of, we got a little schmutz on it now. That's actually a good thing, but we're gonna go a little bit further than that. We're gonna put one of these little guys, a couple of these little guys on here. Um, the reason for this, most people have already figured it out, but I promise you tomorrow morning when I come to work, there'll be at least two dead birds sitting right here in the dirt. That isn't acceptable. We're not gonna have that. So for now, this is just something that they can see that there's something going on, it's not clear. And until the blinds are installed on the inside, these actually are really, really dangerous for birds. We don't get a lot of birds out here, there's no trees. So for us, it's not a super high risk, but in other parts of the world, when I just put in all new glass, if they don't have a roll of painter's tape, I gotta have to do a little cleanup, you know, like I said, get all the stickers off, get the labels off, you know. But again, for the price of a bird's life, I'll take the time to clean this glue up. Okay, now I'm finished. Max, get back to work, dude.